Okay. Hello. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Um, my name is Mara Kaufman, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Brain Trust. We are an online marketplace where parents can connect with certified teachers and learning specialists for private tutoring. And today I'm here with Dr. Michael Rosenthal, a neuropsychologist, to tell us a little bit more about the process of having a neuropsychological evaluation, which I'm going to call a neuropsych evaluation from here on out because <laughs> too many syllables. Um, so, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So um, I'm a, a pediatric neuropsychologist. Um, I trained, uh, I'm a, a clinical psychologist, so I have my, my PhD in, in child and clinical psychology. And, um, and after I did my PhD and, and became a psychologist, I did a, a two-year postdoctoral um, fellowship in pediatric neuropsychology, which sort of is the specialization to become a, a neuropsychologist. Um, and so I finished that training in, um, in D.C., and then I moved up to New York City and uh, worked as a, a staff neuropsychologist at the Child Mind Institute. Um, for a number of years, and then I've been in private practice since uh, 2016 um, on my own. So okay, good. Yeah. And um, what exactly is a neuropsych evaluation? Sure. So it's it's really a type of evaluation that's designed uh, to get a, a kind of a comprehensive understanding of a child's cognitive, uh, academic, and social emotional profiles. Um, it's also designed to answer questions about like why a child specifically might be struggling either inside or outside of school, and then what do we do about it? Like how do we help that child overcome whatever those those challenges are? Um, and in, in terms of the structure of an evaluation, it, it typically involves, um, there's like a number of steps. So there's a parent intake meeting uh, where you sit down with parents and you take a history and just learn a little bit more about the child and, and what their concerns or questions are. Um, and then there's, uh, uh, after that, there's direct testing with the child, which usually is spread out over a few sessions, like two or three sessions, um, where you're doing a number of, uh, I refer to them as kind of like puzzles and brain teasers and different types of problems. Um, um, some stuff is academic, but there's a lot of other types of activities that are a little different than that. Um, and then uh, and then after those meetings, um, there's a parent feedback where you sit back down um, uh, nowadays doing these over Zoom or doing the feedbacks over Zoom, um, where you're sharing with the parents the results of the evaluation. Um, you're answering whatever questions they're coming in with. Um, you know, does my child have a reading problem or what is the nature of the reading issue or why are they having trouble focusing in school, for example? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're also giving them uh, kind of a comprehensive understanding of how their brain works, what kind of learner they are, their, their optimal learning style, and, and ultimately what we need to do in order to help them succeed in school or thrive or overcome whatever the, the challenges are. Um, and, and how do you define whether or not a child has a disability that can be diagnosed as a result of testing, or if it's more just an area of difficulty but not necessarily something that would qualify as a disability. What's the difference between the two? So it's a good question. So, um, I mean, what it comes down to is we, as, as psychologists, as neuropsychologists, we use um, different classification systems like the DSM or the ICD-10, which are um, uh, sort of the hand, our handbooks of determining whether a child meets criteria for something like dyslexia or a math learning disability or ADHD, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so as you know, not all kids who have reading struggles are dyslexic. Not all kids who have attention problems have ADHD. Um, it's really a matter of of degree and severity and how chronic the issue might be. Um, and also uh, generally whether they kind of check those boxes in the DSM or the ICT to, to meet, meet criteria for those. Um, and then there's other things that we're looking at. So a child might have uh, struggle with reading, um, but it could be uh, a problem with their comprehension. Um, and that's a different problem and a different type of disability than a child who struggles with the mechanics of reading with fluency and decoding and so on. Yeah. And I think that from a teacher's perspective, that's why the evaluation is so unbelievably helpful, because instead of trying to, you know, use a trial and error approach to figure out exactly what is going to be most helpful for a child, the 
neuropsych evaluation itself really provides a total roadmap to a child's strengths and their challenges and um, you know the ways in which they're going to learn in the most effective way um, which you know it, it's a big step right how long do these evaluations what kind of a commitment in terms of time and resources does it typically take um. Yeah, so in terms of the, the time and the structure, so it, I'd say from the beginning to the end, it's a, it's a few weeks, right? So mm -hmm. in order to do the parent intake and to collect data and review old reports and talk to um, uh, teachers and, and collect that information and do the testing and the feedback, um, it's a few, like two to three weeks, and then it takes a few more weeks to um, to write up the report. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, it's sort of a, a, a process of trying to implement whatever those recommendations are um, uh, to try to get the child on the on the right path. And um, oftentimes those recommendations include specific accommodations. Um, and are those things that a school is required to put in place after an evaluation? They're just more recommendations. What do you usually see after an evaluation is completed? Sure. I mean, there can be, those are good questions. So there's there's a suite of options or types of recommendations that you might see in the report. Uh, oftentimes for a student, um, there's a set of recommendations that are geared towards uh, the school and what, what, what can we do to help this child in school. And those can range from accommodations like testing accommodations classroom accommodations, um, but also it can be things like um, different types of school options, right? So we might have concerns about the type of school environment that they're currently in and, and want to be able to uh, be descriptive and, and more targeted about the type of instructional program that they need or type of school that they need. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's probably going to be a set of recommendations for things that parents can do for their students or for their children at home as well. Um, so there might be outside therapies or outside treatments or tutoring, um, things that we think they might, uh, they might benefit from. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of what the schools do with these, it really depends. So um, it, it depends if you're working with a private school or a public school, for example. So the public school system um, is, is required to consider these evaluations, but they're not required to always follow everything that you say in the evaluation. So it's usually a, a discussion and sometimes a negotiation with schools. Um, about whether the child, for example, might qualify for an IEP and receive special accommod or special services or accommodations. Um, sometimes they're totally on board and sometimes uh, they have their own opinions and want to do their own investigation. Um, and, and so yeah, it can, it can take a different a few different paths. Um, yeah. And then with private schools, it can be a different uh, different story as well. And how long are the results of an evaluation valid for after it's been, after a report has been submitted? Sure. So the, the general rule is about every two to three years. Mm -hmm. um, I'll recommend an updated evaluation for a student because um, a lot of places like schools and even uh, like uh, testing boards, for example, will only consider the evaluation valid for two to three years. Um, now, that being said, there's there's a number of reasons why you might need you might want to wait longer than two to three years to get an evaluation or do one in a shorter time interval for example for younger kids if i evaluate a three-year-old and uh and and that child has received a lot of services and intervention um the parents might come back to me when they're four and say wow there's been so much progress i want to see what's going on with my child now can we do an update and in that case it makes a lot of sense to do uh, because there's so much growth in that small period of time um and on the other hand you might i might do an evaluation for say an eight or nine year old and they get accommodations put in place they get special support and they're doing great and there's really not a compelling reason to come back and redo the testing mm -hmm. for maybe five years um, and sometimes a one-off is all that's needed and the, and the student is doing fine from that and um after after you have worked with a student do you I guess my question is more, is it possible that a family approaches you with a specific concern or a specific request, in which case you don't need to complete a full range of tests? Like if a parent is concerned specifically about attention and focus and maybe their child having ADHD, is it possible to do ADHD specific testing as opposed to a full neuropsych or do you typically recommend a full examination? 
So I'll tell you, I typically recommend a full evaluation. I'll, I'll tell you why. So I used to do more targeted evaluations. And what would happen is a parent would say, you know, I want to know if my child has ADHD. And you say, okay, we're going to come in. I'll just test for an hour or two. We'll do all the attention battery stuff. And I'll tell you yes or no. And then I would come back and say, it doesn't look like ADHD. And then they'd say, well, what is it? I'd say, well, I, I didn't do any other testing. <laughs> All the only data I have is this attention specific stuff. And so they're sort of left with more questions than answers at that point. Um, yeah. The other reason is that um, even if I did a targeted evaluation and I said, um, yeah, it is ADHD, um, I could be missing a number of other things. So mm -hmm. we know that attention uh, uh, ADHD is highly comorbid. It co-occurs often with things like dyslexia and language challenges and uh, uh, other types of organizational challenges. And by not assessing for those things, we could be sort of shortchanging that student and not putting uh, appropriate or needed services in place for them as well. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and how can a family identify whether or not it's time to get their child evaluated? Um, you know, I know that oftentimes schools will make the recommendation for an evaluation, but I also have worked with families where the school isn't making the recommendation yet, but the parent is very concerned that something might be going on. So is there any sort of general rule of thumb that you think can be a helpful guide towards making that sort of determination? I, I've always been, I always feel like parents um, have a really good gut instinct for this stuff. Mm -hmm. So most of the time when a parent calls me up and says, you know, the school is not concerned, but I just feel like something is, is not connecting, something is amiss. When I end up evaluating that child, usually I find something that validates what that parent's concern was. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, you know, most of the time it's concerns about attention and learning. Those are the most common referral concerns. Um, my son, you know, I'm getting calls from the school or I find that I, they're not listening. I'm, they're watching TV and I have to call their name a million times and, and then they, and then they respond or there's so much frustration at homework. Um, even though the teacher says they're doing well at home, it just doesn't feel like it's, it's working for them. Um, but I think sometimes there's there's other reasons, right? So parents might be concerned that their kids aren't um, forming friendships uh, the way that they, they they think they should, or they're having a lot of conflict with peers, or they look really anxious even though they're getting good grades, or they're really messy and disorganized at home even though they're keeping it together at school. I mean, these can all be signals that something is not working developmentally for that child, or there's something amiss, some issue that we want to um, uh, address. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not having a pronounced impact on their schooling at that time, it could be sort of uh, foreshadowing some problems that might emerge later on. And so I always think that it's good to get out in front of these things. And, and I think uh, using your gut, having your gut instinct is a good kind of indicator that something might not be working well. Yeah. And um, how early do you think is too early for an evaluation in terms of age? Um, I know that I, for example, work with a lot of families that have kindergartners or first graders that are concerned about reading and see that there's sort of attention issues. But at the same time, the parents sort of say, well, he's so young and everyone learns to read at their own pace. Um, so is there a time that seems too early to have an evaluation? So I get this question a lot. Uh, to me, um, it, it, it's never too early. Right. And, and so, yes, there's there's I'm not going to be able to diagnose dyslexia in a four year old. Right. Um, but there's a lot of children um, who who are, are showing some developmental challenges, let's say, in language development that you can identify as young as when they're, you know, two or three. Right. They're delayed in their language or they're not picking up skills the way they should. There might be some issues that they're having in terms of their sensory processing, their behavior, um, their peer interactions. So these are all things that could be red flags for kids um, as young as three or four years old. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I say it's it, the, the it's it's never too young to evaluate a child if we have concerns about how they're functioning at this moment in time. I think the 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 risk is is that we wait too long and then we've lost precious time in order to intervene in that in kind of that in between time. Mm -hmm. um, 
And also with, with things like dyslexia, for example, we talk about reading disabilities a lot. There are some early predictors of, of, re, of later reading proficiency that you can identify before kids are expected to be reading fluently. Mm -hmm. And so if you have things like a family history of dyslexia, you have a child who's struggling with uh, to learn their letters when they're in preschool, or they're having some issues learning to write their name, or they can't hear the sounds in, in, in the words and playing those games, it's just really tough for them. Um, they're avoidant of reading. Um, uh, or they're having some like some language issues. They relate to speak. These are all kind of signs that there might be a reading issue later on. And so you can kind of take all of this data and really get a, a, a reasonable picture of what to look out for. And you can intervene early uh, at that point. Yeah. And I think that also speaks to the point of any sort of early intervention around academic skills and around behavioral challenges can make a world of difference for that child's ability to learn successfully in the classroom down the line. And if those issues can be addressed before they become truly problematic, then you know, you're setting the child up for so much more success down the line than watching them struggle and the impact that has on their confidence. And you know, all of these things are so intertwined um that that proactive approach i think makes a lot of sense absolutely absolutely um i think one one note on this is that there's a lot of neuropsychologists who don't evaluate kids younger than six right and sometimes and other psychologists who don't evaluate much younger children um so i think it's important if you are concerned about your preschooler for example um that you're working with someone who has that skill set who has the tools and knows what to look for in preschoolers yeah yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been really informative. And I will post a link to the conversation on our blog with your contact information so parents can reach out to you if they need a little bit more individualized attention and help and guidance. Great. Um, and I know that your reports are wonderful having worked together over many years. So, you know, it's it's a really helpful step for families that are at all concerns. And I think that trusting your gut if the school isn't saying something is a good, you know, piece of advice for tackling this tricky, murky territory. And I'm sure reaching out to you to simply ask, you are also able to give a recommendation as to whether you think now seems like a good time for an evaluation or if it seems better to just kind of hold off um, until later date. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks again. All right. Thanks, Mara. Bye, Mike. Bye.